then you can be happy and you can be secure. And that's what many people actually believe. You know, it's about, it's about a false god of money. But the reality is that no matter how much money that you accumulate, no matter how much you make, no matter how much you have, one devastating report from the doctor, one moment of disaster, and you're going to realize that it doesn't matter how much you have, it doesn't make you secure. It's a false promise of hope. Money says that if you have enough, you'll be happy, and it doesn't matter how much money you have, one day if you find out that you've lost a kid or you've lost a loved one, there's no amount of money that can ever buy happiness in that moment. It's a false promise, and it's a false God, and it promises something that it does not provide. Now, in the life of Elijah, many people were living these idolatrous lives. I mean, they were worshiping and serving a lot of different false gods, two main ones. And if you missed last week, I want to catch you up. I want to review a little bit to give you some context of where we're going today. Elijah was a man that was called by God to confront a very evil king. Now, this very evil king, his name was Ahab, and you probably never really heard of him very much, but, you, but he was married to a woman that most of you would have heard of. Her name was, anybody remember? Jezebel. Jezebel. Everybody heard of Jezebel. So if anybody ever calls you a Jezebel, it's not good. It's not good. She was very, very evil. And Ahab, he was the 19th consecutive evil king. So there was these whole string of evil leaders and, and, and bad leaders. And scripture tells us that Ahab, he was so bad that he did more evil in the eyes of God than any one of these kings before him. He was the absolute worst of the worst, and he had a long list of sins and just and just continued just doing some things that was just horrible. But the worst thing that Ahab did is that he continued turning the hearts of people away from the one true God and kept pointing them in the direction of the false gods of Baal and Asherah. Now, Baal was the sun god. Some people call him Baal. Baal was the sun god or the fire god, and Asherah was kind of like Baal's wife. And, and, and the people, they were, they were no longer worshiping the one true God of Abraham. They had stopped this. Instead, they began worshiping all of these false gods. And they believed that the, the promises that these false gods made, these false gods made promises like, you know, if you worship me, if you make sacrifice to me, then we'll make the crops grow for you. If you worship me, you know, you're going to have a, a better life. And this is not uncommon because false gods always promise what only the one true God can provide. You know, so God, he calls this prophet named Elijah, and Elijah confronts the king and basically says, because of all this idolatry, God has sent me to tell you, it ain't going to rain until God tells me to pray and ask for. So, so there's this onset drought, and it's just terrible. I mean, this is an economic breaker. I mean, it, it is horrible. This drought is bad. Tons of people are dying. It's the worst thing that you can imagine. And so God sends Elijah into this period of hiding during this time. Why? Because King Ahab wanted him dead. He wanted him dead. He might not have took him very seriously when he and Ahab were having this conversation, but after this drought, after some time of this drought, He's pretty upset with me. So, you know, so Elijah, he goes into hiding, and he says to everybody, you know, Ahab says to everybody, if you find Elijah, then you kill him on the spot and bring him to me. Don't let him live. You kill him right there. And so God takes Elijah to this place called the Kerith Ravine. And if you were here last week, Kerith actually means a place of cutting down. It's a place of humbling. So God puts him in this place, and he humbles him, and he develops him into this strong man of God. And it's interesting because during a time of famine, during a time of drought, God provides for Elijah through some ravens. You know, God feeds him every morning, feeds him bread, would feed him a piece of meat, you know, through the ravens. He had water to drink from a brook. But one day this brook, of course, it dries up. <coughs> and God calls him to move on to a place known as... Uh, and Zarephath, and there was a widow that he that he actually brought him into this widow's home, and God miraculously provides for him with some oil and some flour that never runs dry. Now we said in the story last week that one day the widow's son actually dies, and we don't know why he died. We don't know if he got sick. We don't know what happened, 
But Elijah, this growing man of faith, he takes this woman's son to the upper room and he calls out to God. And Elijah raises this boy from the dead. And what we see is we see this prophet developing into this man of God that God wants him to become. And in our last verse of last week, we're told that Elijah, he goes into hiding. So we're going to kind of pick up there and we find out, find out now that God wants him to go and confront the evil king once again. So, so we're going to pick up the story where he's coming to confront the evil king, Ahab. We're about three years into this drought. So we're in 1 Kings 18, if you want to follow along in your Bibles. If not, we have some scripture on the screen. So here we see Elijah and we see Ahab together again. So scripture says, verse 17, when he, that would be Ahab, when Ahab saw Elijah, he said to him, Is that you, you troubler of Israel? Now, I actually looked up some of the Hebrew word for troubler. Troubler can be actually interpreted as viper. So what Ahab saying to him, he's saying, hey, you're the low down dirty snake that caused this. You know, it's your fault that, that, that people are dying. It's your fault that there's a huge drought. It's all because of you, Elisha. <coughs> and Elijah, he, he, he takes an attitude with this. He says, no, 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 no. I ain't taking that from you. Verse 18, he says, I have not made trouble for Israel. He says, but you and your father's family have. Now, remember I told you there was a whole string of bad kings? Well, this is why they had just completely moved them away from God. He says, Ahab, you and your father's family have. You have abandoned the Lord's commands, and you have followed the Baals. In other words, it's your fault. You're committing the sin of adultery. You're putting false gods ahead of the one true God. And Elijah's confronting this very popular idea of the day that there are many gods out there. You know, and here's what I find interesting. As I read this, you know, I began to think as Christians, we worship one true God. We worship the God of Abraham. We might call him Jehovah, whatever you want to call him, but he is the one true God. And what is interesting to me is that if you look at many Christians' lives, how they live from, from day to day, we're not actually living as if we're that one true follower of Christ. In fact, I would argue that many Christians' lives today you know, they live them as if they're not sure who or what they might worship. We believe in God, but in reality, we worship and we serve many false gods. Now, I'm not going to say that we're worshiping the gods of the Baals or, or Asher or anything like that. But in reality, the false gods that we worship today, they're much more socially acceptable. I mean... Let's just be honest. With you. They're much more socially acceptable. A lot of people, they worship, as we said, that false god of money. Some people worship that false god of material possessions. You know, your house, your car, could be your, your image or your look or your maybe even your favorite sports team. Could be your career. It could be your hobby. Could be any of those things. <coughs> and I would even argue that, oddly enough, it could be your children. And I mean, I know what you're thinking. Well, how in the world could my children be, be a false god? You know, how, how in the world could that happen? Well, here's the thing. The Bible tells us that if you elevate anything into the rightful place of where God should be, and you put anything on the throne of your life besides God, then that is idolatry. And even something as good as in, and important as your children. So that's why I would ask you the question today. What are the false gods that you serve? What are the false gods that you put ahead of the one true God? Now, I, had, I, I can remember a pastor telling me this one time. He said, you know, Tony, he says, it's all right to have nice things as long as the nice things don't have you. And I think for all of us, <coughs> that's a problem for us, especially being blessed in America. I can remember serving under one pastor, and I would tell you that probably his false god of the day was the church. Because he was all about leadership. He was all wound up in leadership. And, and we see this, you know, as leaders of the church, we've, we've been in this position. I mean, there's books out there on leadership. There's conferences out there on leadership. I want to tell you, the best way to be a good leader, be the best follower. Be the best follower. But that it wasn't what happened with this guy. He got all caught up in leadership. And all of a sudden, you know, everything's about growing the church. Everything's, And the next thing you know, everything's imploding on. You know, for me, one of my false gods that I get hung up on is security for my family. 
You know, I'll just be transparent about that. It's security for my family. I want my family to be secure. I want to know that when I'm gone or, or when I get old, that there's going to be enough money, there's going to be enough stuff there to take care of my family. And that's a false God for me that I worship. So I'd ask you to be honest today. What are some of the false gods that you've elevated and erected into the place of the one true God? What are some of those false gods? <coughs> so Elijah, he steps into this culture that worships these false gods, and he makes this very prophetic and this very strong statement. If you're taking notes, I can pretty well summarize this story in one message. He looks at them as they're going back and forth between God and, and, the, and Baal and, and just back and forth. And he just comes right down and he says, you know, people, it's time to quit wavering. It's time to stop. Quit wavering between the gods. Stop going back and forth. It's time to stop. So here's what he does. Elijah, he basically says, we're going to have a showdown between the gods here. I want you to watch what he says to the king in verse 19. Verse 19, he says, <coughs> Now some of the people from all over Israel to meet me on Mount Harm and bring the 450 prophets of Baal and the 450 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. And I want to tell you, that must have been a big table because that many people... He basically says, he says, you get everybody here. I want everybody to witness this. I don't want anybody to miss this. You get everybody here. You bring these 450 prophets of Baal, the 450 of Asher. You bring them all. You're going to need all the help you can get. Bring them all. Get them all here. And we're going to see what happens. Verse 21, Elijah goes on. He says, Ahab sends word throughout Israel, brings everybody to Mount Carmel. Elijah went before the people and said, and this is the message I think that, that he would say to us today. How long will you waver between the two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, then follow him. But the people said nothing. You know, Elijah comes to him and he basically says, how long are you going to do this? You know, if God is God, then follow him. If Baal is God, then follow him. And I can guarantee you that if Elijah was here today, he'd say the same thing to us. How long are you going to continue to do this? Quit wavering. Quit wavering. Because the truth is, many of us, that's exactly how we live. We live with this idea of, yeah, well, God, you know, God, you, you keep me out of hell and get me into heaven. But I still want to be able to have the freedom to do whatever I want whenever I want with whoever I want. You know, God, you know, you listen to my prayer, you hear me, bless me, but please don't ask me to obey those commands because I, I don't know that I can do that. You know, God, I want all of your good things, but I'm not sure I want to stop my bad things. Elijah would tell us today, quit wavering. Quit being a Christian on Sunday morning and living like you don't know Christ on Monday. You know, quit claiming Christ and living like you don't know him at all. Quit wanting the benefits and being unwilling to sacrifice. Just quit wavering. Take a side. Just take a side. In fact, here's what I think Elijah would honestly say to us today. If your false God, whatever that little, little G God is, and you, you know what that is. I don't know what that is, but we all know what that is. If that, if that God is really God, then sell out to him. Just sell out to him. Be done with it. In other words, if material possessions... If that's what's really most important in your life, then just quit sort of accumulating them. You know, you go out and you get all you can. Whatever you got to do. Because if accumulating stuff, if that's the greatest thing in your life, then everything's justified. Everything's justified. You know, and by the way, don't ever give away anything ever again. Don't ever do anything generous because that, that would diminish your ultimate goal of accumulating. If material possessions is your true God, then go for it. Go do it. Do whatever you want. If that's your God, go for it. If your house, if that's your God, quit doing one little room at a time. Just go into debt, hire the best, landscape it, tweak it out. You know, if those things are your God, then quit playing around and just go for it. But I think Elijah would tell us, but wait a minute. If Christ, the Son of God, 
is the one true God, then quit wavering. Quit wavering. Start serving him with all of your heart. Don't just claim him and then live, live as if he doesn't exist. Go out and serve him. Go out and worship him every day. So what did Elijah decide to do with this? He decides that there's going to be a showdown. And he tells him, you go and you guys, you, you servants of these gods, you go get two bulls. One for you, one for me. We're going to build a couple of altars. And we're going to sacrifice these, these animals to each of our gods. You call on your god. I'll call on my god. And we're going to see whose god really is god. So we're going to pick up the story and see what happens. Verse 24 begins this way. It says, you call on the name of your God, and I'll call on the name of the Lord. And the God who answers by fire, he is God. Then all the people said, what you say is good. Now, I'm going to pause here a minute because here's the thing. You know, everyone's thinking the same thing. You know, chances are there ain't going to be any fire. There's not going to be any fire. We haven't seen or heard from God for years. All we've had is these prophets running around saying, God said, God said. We've not actually heard from God or seen anything for years. Nothing's going to happen. And if there is going to be any fire, it's going to come from Baal. I mean, after all, he's the sun god. He's the god of fire. So look what happens. Verse 25 and verse 26. Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, Choose one of the bulls and prepare it first, since there are so many of you. In other words, you guys just go ahead and go first. Call on the name of your God, but don't light the fire. You allow God to do that. So the prophets, they took the bull given to them, and they prepared it. And they called on the name of Baal from morning till noon. Baal, answer us. They began to shout, but there was no response. No one answered. So then they danced around the altar that they had made, and nothing happened. Which was exactly what everyone standing around thought was going to happen. Nothing. So I love this. Elijah, he, he sees all this going on. And I mean, this is going on and on and on. And he starts goading them a little bit. I mean, it's actually kind of funny what he does. You know, this is a man of God and he starts messing with him. So here's what he does. Verse 28. At noon, Elijah began to talk to him. He says, shout louder. He said, surely he is a God. I mean, perhaps he's in deep thought. You know, God's in deep thought. He ain't got time for this. You know, or maybe he's busy. Maybe he's traveling because maybe he's just out of the picture. Maybe he's sleeping and that needs to be awakened. You know, he just keeps taunting him. This goes on all day long. The false gods, they promised, but they couldn't deliver. And then look at what Elijah does. He builds an altar. He slaughters the bull, prepares it for sacrifice, and just to show how great the God of Abraham truly is, he drenches the wood with water. Not once, not twice, but three times he drenches it. I mean, the Bible says he dug trenches around this wood, and the trenches were actually full of water. Okay, remember, they're in a drought. They're in a drought. So he's taking what little bit of water is left. He's throwing all the cards in drenches it down with water and look at what Elijah does verse 36 at the time of the sacrifice the prophet Elijah stepped forward and what did he do he prayed he prayed the Bible says that he prayed he didn't dance he didn't shout he didn't cut himself like the prophets did he didn't do anything to get extra special attention from God he simply prayed Pray. Now, can you see the power in that? Listen to this prayer. Listen to this. He prayed, Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and I've done all these things at your command. Listen to this. Answer me, Lord. Answer me. So these people will know that you, Lord, are God and that you are turning their hearts back again. Can you see the power in that prayer? Answer me, O Lord. Reveal yourself. Show us who you are. Let me see you, Lord. Why? So that you can turn the hearts of the people back <clears throat> again. Because the truth is, they used to know you. They used to walk with you. They used to serve you, and they used to worship you, Father. 
But these false gods, they've taken the place of you. So turn their hearts back again. Somewhere along the way, I want to tell you, many of us, we've fallen for a lie. We have fallen for a lie from our spiritual enemy because we used to serve the Lord. We used to walk with him in his word. We used to trust him in our lives. But somewhere along the way, some little false god came along and whispered in your ear. And it was subtle at first, just a whisper, just a desire placed in your heart. But I want to tell you something. Given enough time, whispers have turned into shouts. Desires turn into obsessions. And all because some little God come along and promised you something that only the Lord could give. You know, next week we're going to talk about why we worry so much in our lives, why we're always so worried about things and I'm going to give you a little bit of an inside track for next week it's because we're listening to the wrong voice we're listening to the wrong voices in our life we're listening to the wrong God now I'll be honest I don't know what that God is for you but you do look at where you spend your money look at where you spend your time look at where you 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 focus your efforts you know what that God is this story of Elijah, it ends with God doing just as God promised. He sent fire, he sent rain, and Elijah and the people, they saw this. The people actually slew the prophets that were the, of Baal, and the people turned back to the Lord. All because one man had enough courage and had enough faith to stand for what he knew was right. So today, here's what I want to do. I want to close with reading Bob's prayer again. And as I read this prayer, I want you to think about this. Because this is something we can just roll off pretty easy. But the truth of the matter is, I think he hits home for all of us. And it may be a prayer for you. It may be a prayer for me. But I'm going to tell you what. It's certainly a prayer for our nation. It's certainly a prayer for our nation. And I want to encourage you today as we pray, as, we pray, as I read this prayer, and as we come to a close, if this is something that just resonates with you, with you then at the end, just simply end this by saying amen. Because God listens to our prayers. He hears every prayer of everyone who cries out to him. So I'm going to ask you today if you would pray with me as I read this prayer. Oh God, we know what your word says. Woe to those who call evil good. But that's exactly what we've done. We've lost our spiritual equilibrium. And we've inverted our values. We confess, Father, that we have ridiculed the absolute truth of your word, and we've called it more pluralism. We've worshipped other gods, and we've called it multiculturalism and New Age spirituality. We've committed adultery and caused, called it an affair. We've endorsed perversion and called it an alternative lifestyle. We've exploited the poor and called it the lottery. We've neglected the needy and called it frugality. We've rewarded laziness and called it welfare, and we've killed our unborn children, and we've called it choice. We've shot abortions, and we've even called that justifiable. Father, we've neglected to discipline our children, and we've called that building self-esteem. And we've failed to ex execute justice speedily, as your word commands, and we've called it due process. We've failed to love our neighbor, who is a different color of skin, and we've called that maintaining racial purity. We have abused power and we've called it political sanity. We have coveted our neighbor's possessions and we've called that ambition. We've polluted the air with profanity, with pornography, and we've called it freedom of expression. And we have taken the Lord's Day and made it the biggest shopping day and the biggest entertainment day of the week. And we called that free enterprise. We have ridiculed the time-honored values of our parents and we've called that enlightenment. Search us, O God. Know our hearts today. Try us and see if there is some wicked way in us. And Father, I ask, I ask if you would just cleanse us of every sin and set us free. Set us free. Though our sins be as scarlet, may they be as white as snow. Though they may be as crimson, may they be as white as wool. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. I want to ask our musicians to come forward to close us this morning. And I want to give you an opportunity, as we do every Sunday. If you never called upon the Lord Jesus, 
as your Savior. This is an 